Hello, welcome to an adventure. Um, as always, if the uh, sound levels, if there's anything off with that, do let me know. If the captions aren't working for some reason, do let me know. Um, but welcome to Archival Adventures. I am Anthony Wright de Hernandez, your host. Uh, and today on Archival Adventures, we're gonna be looking at the Freeze Textile Plant Records. Um, but first, I have the Land and Labor Acknowledgement from Virginia Tech that I'd like to cover before we get started. So uh, Virginia Tech acknowledges that we live and work on the Tutelo and Monacan people's homeland, and we recognize their continued relationships with their, their lands and waterways. We further acknowledge that legislation and practices like the Morrill Act of 1862 enabled the Commonwealth of Virginia to finance and found Virginia Tech through the forced removal of Native nations from their lands, both locally and in Western territories. We understand that honoring Native peoples without explicit material commitments falls short of our institutional responsibilities. Those through sustained, transparent, and meaningful engagement with the Tutelo and Monacan peoples and other Native nations, we commit to changing the trajectory of Virginia Tech's history by increasing Indigenous student, staff, and faculty recruitment and retention, diversifying course offerings, and meeting the growing needs of all Virginia tribes and supporting their sovereignty. We must also recognize that enslaved black people generated revenue and resources used to establish Virginia Tech and were prohibited from attending until 1953. Through Inclusive VT, the institutional and individual commitment to ut prosim that I may serve, in the spirit of community, diversity, and excellence, we commit to advancing a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive community. Thank you for uh, consistently letting me read that. I mean, it's not like you really have control. It's my stream and I get to decide what goes out, but um, you stick around for it. And so I appreciate that. I think it is important to continually recognize that those words have meaning and we need to hold the, institutional, uh, the institution accountable for what it says it's going to do. Um, <clears throat> anyway, welcome in everybody. Um, I'm going to go ahead and say hello to Lord Portico and Key Squared and Fluid Ann and Hannah. Welcome to the stream. Um, as I said, today we are going to be looking at some materials from a textile plant in southwest Virginia. Um, and when I say textile plant, the records are from the textile plant, but a lot of what we're going to be looking at today is actually kind of like town records from Freeze, Virginia, because the textile plant owned the entire town. All the stores, the church, the school, everything in town, all of the houses in town, were owned by the Freeze Textile Plant. So we've got records from an actual company town in Appalachian uh, United States, in, like in the Appalachian Mountain region of the United States. Um, this one, I mean, a lot of, when people talk about uh, company towns in the Appalachian region of the United States, they often talk about coal towns. This was not a coal town, this was a textile plant uh, so a place that made cloth and um, they were actually a highly sought after employer. Uh, it, it was considered a good job, um, but it has those problems of, hey, the company that is the main employer in town also owns everything in town. Um, and I don't know, we'll have to look at the information in the finding aid to be sure, but the Freeze Textile Plant operated in Freeze, Virginia well into the 20th century. Um, so we're going to look at that. Um, also, hi Simsilica, how are you today? It's good to see you. Um, my screen here is not uh, refreshing information for me, so I'm just going to refresh the screen and see if that fixes it. Um, anyway, I hope everybody is having a great Wednesday. Um, oh, and I do see that we, we have a raid coming in. Yes, indeed. Uh, welcome in uh, Whimsies from 16-Bit Eric. I hope that you had a wonderful time uh, playing Subnautica, um, which is a very interesting video game. Uh, underwater exploration. Uh, we typically raid out of this stream into the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Uh, but the whole sci-fi alien planet underwater exploration aspect of Subnautica makes it a quite interesting, um, quite interesting game. And, and if you're 
at all interested in oceanography, I think that you would enjoy it. Um, anyway, welcome in, Whimsies. Um, we are about to get started, but uh, hello, Obi-Wan Pez. Hello, Eagle Sight. Hello, Be Right UK. Uh, thank you for the bits. Um, <laughs> last background song reminded you of some epic video game music. Oh, uh, so the music that we do use on this stream is provided by Pretzel, and um, I just queue up the chill pianos, uh, the chill piano channel on Pretzel Rocks, and that is what we listen to during Archival Adventures. I don't have any custom music, and Pretzel um, provides access to uh, music that is safe for streaming, uh, meaning that it's not going to be subject to DMCA or anything like that. Um, and so, yeah, this is, this is Pretzel Rock's Chill Piano. Uh, so if you go to that station on Pretzel Rock's, you should be able to find the song. Unfortunately, I don't know which song it was. Um, also, hi, Geek Outs. Uh, Chill Piano is not what is playing today. It's still good music, though. I mean, the channel is Chill Piano. Uh, that is the channel that I have turned on. Whether what's actually ending up uh, playing is, is chill piano stuff? I can't say, but that is the channel that I have queued up. Um. <laughs> it's approved by the stream's unofficial not your lawyer. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we, we, I do use uh, Pretzel Rocks for this and my personal streams um, just because it provides access to music that I can have in the background without having to worry about it being in the VOD later or anything like that. Eventually, um, uh, we do have on the VTUL Studios channel, we do have some music production uh, streams, and eventually they will be putting together music that we can use for our streams. Um, I don't know the status of that, but the, the music production streams that happen on that channel, they're composing music that we will be able to use on stream later. Um, and yeah, if you're at all interested in that, check out um, the VTUL Studios Twitch channel where you can learn about uh, music composition tools and kind of uh, watch some actual music being uh, created. Um, thank you, Portico, for putting the, the shout out to VTUL Studios there. Uh, you hear piano and crickets. Yeah, it does kind of sound like crickets, I think, Eagle Sight. Um, Anyway, uh, welcome again, everybody who came over from 16-Bit Eric's channel. Today on Archival Adventures, we are taking a look at the Freeze Textile Plant Records. Um, and as I was explaining uh, before you all showed up, the Freeze Textile Plant, um, uh, Freeze, the company owned the entire town of Freeze, Virginia. Uh, so we're looking at the records of a company but they're also the records of the town because it was a company town, they owned everything in town. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna pull up where I can see it, the, um, the finding aid for this, uh, so that I can tell you a little bit about Freeze, Virginia. Um, and I'll even drop the link uh, to the finding aid for you. One moment. I, of course, did not uh, prepare the link in advance because that would mean that I had prepared in advance. Uh, <laughs> go figure. Um, it, it's okay, we're just, we're just doing it live. Uh, which, that's what Twitch is all about, do it live. So, uh, Since I'm doing this for two channels at the same time, I have to remember that I need to drop this link in two places. Uh, we'll start with the VTUL Studios channel. Uh, that is a link to the finding aid for what we are going to be looking at today. Um, let me grab that link for the Rogan27 channel. Um, if it's your first time here, I do stream to two channels at the same time for this show. I stream to the VTUL Studios channel, that is the Virginia Tech University Libraries Studios channel, as well as to my own personal Twitch channel. Um, and so if you see me looking back and forth, uh, I've got one chat over here and one chat over here. So that's what's going on there. Uh, that is, 
Wait, what is this? Prepare? Is that an early stages of a fruit? I don't, I don't know Portico. Um, but that is the link to the finding aid. I'm going to read the historical information about the freeze textile plant so that we have a basis for understanding what we're going to be looking at um, in the next few minutes. Uh, so let me take a look here. Oh, this is some interesting uh, and unique history for this collection, and I do think it's worth just noting there is a uh, source of acquisition note in here that says the freeze textile plant records were deposited with special collections and university archives in 1989. Ownership of the collection was transferred in 2016. Additional blueprints and slides were donated in December 2016 and July 2019. So the materials were put in the archives in 1989. They were given to us in 1989 and we housed them, but we didn't own them and nothing was done with them because ownership of them belonged to the company and the company just put them here so that they would be stored and, and preserved in that way. Um, the company later shut down and it took quite a while for the town of Fries to ultimately decide to officially donate the materials to Virginia Tech, um, at which time we then uh, processed the materials, got them organized, and made them available for research purposes. But um, during that period where they were just here but we didn't own them, they weren't a high priority for organizing and processing and spending all of the, the time and material in order to get them ready to uh, actually be housed as a, an official collection um, because at any time the owners could take them back. And so we, weren't, we had other collections to work on and other collections to invest our time in, and so they sat. Um, until they were officially donated to us in 2016, at which point we dedicated resources to getting them processed and made available. Uh, so let me read the administrative history here, which will tell a little bit about what this collection is. In 1903, Colonel Francis Henry Fries founded the town of Fries and constructed a textile plant in Grayson County, Virginia. Fries was president of the Washington Mills Company, as well as Wachovia Bank, for some time. He used his business and political collections, er, connections to build a spur to a main branch of the Norfolk and, Re Norfolk and Western Railroad and to construct a dam on the New River to generate power for the mill. The Washington Mills Company owned nearly every building in the town which flourished in the early 20th century with a population of over 1,700 by 1910. By 1929, there were four textile mills in Grayson County, and Washington Mills in Freeze was the largest, employing as many as 600 people. Employment at Washington Mills peaked after World War II with over 1,200 workers. For decades, the mill had cutting-edge equipment and com competed nationally with other textile production facilities. By the 1980s, the company faced overseas competition and the need to modernize the plant. In 1988, company leaders chose to close the plant, which at that time employed only a few hundred workers. The collection includes correspondence, ledgers, production records, employee records, photographs, photo fabric samples, and other items documenting the history of the town and plant from their creation in the early 1900s to the close of the mill in 1988. So that is uh, what we're going to be looking at today. <laughs> oh, Portico. So many puns in that sentence. Um, so, what I have pulled is a variety of material uh, from this collection. I... This collection has hundreds of boxes. It is a very, very large collection, and uh, the it's divided into seven series, um, company files, correspondence, financial records, personnel records, production materials, legal records, and blueprints. Um, so I have pulled some things. Uh, looking at it, approaching it, knowing I wanted to stream about it, but knowing I, that it was enormous. Like I, at a glance, I see there's 122 folders at least 
or sorry, 122 boxes at least. Um, I had a little bit of difficulty figuring out where to start because we've got two hours here and um, honestly, we could lose ourselves in one box for two hours. So I reached out to the person who spent more than a year organizing and describing this collection and asked for suggestions about which boxes and folders to pull to share uh, from this collection. And so that's where I came up with the things that we have to look at. Um, I think, I think we might start with a box. This being um, box number 181. And I believe this has fabric samples. It does. Um, so one of the things that I asked for when I asked what should I, uh, when I was asking for suggestions or, or guidance on how to navigate the collection, I had asked for any um, sort of advertising material that, that there might be, any promotional or ad, ads uh, for the products of the mill. And that's one thing that actually kind of isn't in the collection. There's no ads. And you, you all, if you've watched a few um, episodes, know that I enjoy, eat, er, I enjoy eating ads. I enjoy reading old ads. Um, so I was kind of disappointed by that. But rather than ads, we have samples of their actual products. So that is where we're gonna to start today, I think. Uh, let me go ahead and switch us over to the top-down camera, the document focus here. And we'll take a look at some of their actual products. So what we have here, I don't know the date of production because um, the date of production is not on here, but this will give you a sense of kind of some of the products that they were making. Um, this is marked as uh, from the Freeze Textile Company. Um, style or sample number, FFH, don't know what that means. That's internal company number. Uh, this is uh, 64 inches in width, uh, 1.18 pounds. Um, this is a twill of 65% polyester and 35% cotton. Um, and you can see this is kind of like a rough muslin. It's a twill, but it, like it's a rough, kind of a rough cloth. Um, I don't know how well you can see the weave on it. Uh, let me see if I can autofocus with it zoomed in. And you all can tell me if looking at the cloth is absolutely boring, in which case I will move on to other stuff. But I thought it would be interesting to kind of get a, a glance at some of the material. This is um, exactly how this was given to us. So folded up like this with this sticker on it. Um, and it's just been placed into a box, into a, an archival box. Um, there are other methods for uh, preserving textiles, but um, that is how these have been preserved. And wow, that looks blurry, doesn't it? <laughs> it's because I autofocused when I was zoomed in. <clears throat> we'll be autofocusing a bit here. Uh, this one from the Washington Weaving Company is actually... Uh, it's been dyed. It actually has a color to it. Most of the samples that we have do not have any color to them at all. Uh, this was apparently from February 19th, 1975. And this is a, uh, let's see, 100% polyester warp, 100% cordelan filling. Um, and you can see this kind of... Um, seafoam green cloth, which uh, I know everybody who came over from 16-bit Eric's channel will be fami familiar with the color seafoam green. Um, one second, I'm, I'm rolling on a cord, as always. Oh yay, we have people that know cloth. Uh, twills are generally a nice sturdy fabric. I know they are sometimes used in corsets. And there are twill tapes 
uh, which are often used for binding edges and for ribbons. Thank you, Hannah. I don't know a ton about cloth. I was never a costume design person. I was more of a set design and lighting design person when it came to theater. So um, you can see this has gotten dusty at, at some point, and so it's, it's kind of like dark. Um, if I open up to an unfolded edge, this is, it's a super light seafoam green. You can see the, um, you can see the knit of the fabric uh, with the little gaps between threads. Um, I would, I would expect this to be, I don't know, this is 1970s. This seems like shirt fabric to me. Um, polyester and cordelan. Let's see what else we have. Uh, well, this one's not labeled, so we'll set it aside. Um, here we have a poplin, which is definitely a shirt fabric. Uh, zoom in on this by bringing it closer to the camera. You can see a little bit of the weave on this one. This is a poplin. And as always, it's kind of this undyed, um, just beige color. You really only know about twill thanks to some historical sewing and costuming YouTube channels. Um, yeah, I, there, are, there are some really good costumers out there that I'm sure would go into this in more depth. I am not one of those, but I thought that this would be interesting. So <clears throat> this is from the Freeze Textile Company. This is a poplin, 65% poly, 65 polyester and 35% cotton. If anybody knows the difference between a twill and a poplin, feel free to drop that in chat. Or if you want to go and look it up, I'm happy to read what you find um, while we look at some other stuff. Um, the next one I have here is a corduroy. <clears throat> this is from June 22nd, 1977. You can see it's um, kind of stitched together here at the bottom because this is just a fabric sample. But this is a corduroy fabric. Um, and if you're familiar with corduroy from like the corduroy jeans or like actual garments that are made of corduroy, you're probably used to the, the warp and weft, the deep, the deep grooves um, and kind of that like speed bumpy texture of corduroy. And this is not like that at all, which surprises me um, because that's what I understood corduroy to be. But you can see here, uh, it's a very different kind of textural uh, weave than the last ones that we looked at. It has the, the kind of speed bumpiness to it. It's just not as pronounced as what I would expect on like a pair of corduroy pants. Um, but it, it definitely has that same construction to it. It just doesn't, it's, those bumps are basically flat but they're still there in, in the way that it's put together. Poplin is more lightweight and breathable than twill, according to your search. Okay. So these are some of the products that this, um, that this company town were, was putting out. Um, and I thought it would be interesting to kind of glance at them up front. Here we have another twill, 50% polyester, 50% cotton. Um, and then another twill, 65% polyester, 35% cotton. Quite a few twills in here. Uh, let's see. That's, that's what I wanted to get from, from this box was kind of just the experience of looking and seeing some of the actual products. Since we can't look and see their advertisements for their products. I thought actually seeing some of the things that they actually produced would be interesting. Here's more of corduroy, some more poplin, another corduroy. Let's see if there's anything else particularly stand out here. Corduroy. 
I think it's just more of the same in this box. So we'll look at some of the documents now or photographs or other stuff like that since now we have a sense of kind of what it was that these people were putting out. They were putting out large batches of um, fabric that was used to manufacture actual like clothing and other materials products for sale in the United States and presumably abroad I don't know but let's see I have what is we'll look at our first document and see what we can learn uh, this one is marked as cotton book I f this is uh, cotton book 1915 to 1933. Um, this is a tag that actually was in here. It's not been added by us. It was uh, slipped into the book itself before the book came to us. Uh, this little slip up here is just so I remember where it goes when I need to put it back. Um, but let's, let's see what this cotton book is all about. So I don't know how well you can see it, but here at the top it says, see page 130 for sundry. Um, which we may get to, they're not numbered pages. So uh, I'm just gonna flip through until we actually find some content in here. The lettered pages at the beginning, they seem to have skipped past. So we will do the same. All right, we have a... Hi, E. Lordan. I think the main thing about twill is that the weave has diagonal ribs, while poplin is a pretty straightforward horizontal and vertical weave. Thank you for the clarification. And, and yeah, I think the weave actually showed up really good on camera. I'm very glad about that. Um, but thank you for clarifying because I've never known the difference between the different fabrics other than like corduroy is bumpy, but corduroy is not bumpy because these aren't bumpy. But anyway. <laughs> um, ah, okay. So here we, have, um, here we have a section in this ledger. I don't know why this book is called The Cotton Book, but this ledger starts off employment certificate. And let's let's just talk a little bit about this, um, this handwriting here, because this handwriting is surprising. And like barely even cursive. In fact, not cursive. This is printed, but really difficult to read until you recognize that these X's are T's. But so employment certificate. Uh, and here we're looking at, looks like 1914 to start, May 20th, 1914, May 21st, 1914. For some reason there's a, a random June 22nd in there before it goes to May 23rd, um, but um, date issued, issued to, permit for, present age, date of birth, place of birth, uh, as it goes further along to the side. Um, so the first entry here, May 20th, 1914, is for Cynthia Shoup. Um, Permit for Zella Shoup, age 13. Born September 4th, 1900 in Pocahontas. Uh, I don't know, under the county column it says never went to work. Um, in West Virginia. Number certificate, one. 
date returned, July 1st, 1914. So these are, what this book is, this is a documentation of employment certificates, as noted. And these employment certificates are for teenage workers at this textile plant. Uh, so the first one here, Zella Shoup was 13. Uh, we have Emma Dickin at, at 17, Robbie Dickin at 14, uh, Horner or Homer, Homer Dickin at 16, uh, Edgar Tate 15, Vinnie Tate 14, Maud Chandler 14. Um, most of these are 14 or 15 year old textile workers uh, in the 19 teens. A um, couple of them a little bit older. And when I was pulling things out to, to look at them for this stream, I saw this book and I was like, wow, that's a lot of teenage workers. And tried to go and find out about Virginia employment law and uh, at the time in the mid 19 teens to see um, what was required because this is this is employment certificate uh, and they've been issued it looks like to the parent for the teenage worker um, this is like a worker's permit and I wasn't able in the time that I had to narrow down what the requirements were for teenage workers in Virginia in 1915 um, I know off, but like I know from when I was a teenage worker in Virginia um, that it, in the like late 1990s you had to have um, you had to be a, a like 15 and a half years old to even be consider getting a job um, before that it wasn't really possible here we've got people who are in their 14s and 15s, uh, and it looks like they needed an employment certificate issued to their parents in order for them to work. Um, but basically, this is a ledger of teenage labor in materials production in the United States in the 19-teens. Um, I do know that more modern employment law specifically prohibits factory work for teenagers in Virginia. Um, I wonder how the demographics of the employees changes over time with things like child labor laws and civil rights. Yeah, and I am not certain. That is definitely a question, though, that these records would probably enable you to explore because these records span such a long period of time and ultimately get up to 1988. Um, and like these, these are, this book starts in 1915. Um, in fact, actually, the date on here is 1914 for a lot of them. So definitely a question that a researcher could probably explore using these materials. Um, I, in the week I had to grab things for this uh, stream, did not have time to do that research myself. Um, but it, that would definitely be an interesting question to explore. This gets us up to 1916, and um, we definitely have, up through that time, additional uh, people noted, teenagers noted. There's a lot of stuff crossed out later in this book, and I am uncertain. I think maybe this was used to track like actual cotton production lines and things like that, and then later was um, used to track uh, those employment certificates. But I'm not certain. Like, this stuff is is gobbledygook to me. I, I don't know what any of this portion of the book is. Um, here we have, looks like maybe shipping records or something of the sort, uh, or sales records for cotton, I would assume. Um, Singer Manufacturing Company, One Box, Westinghouse, One Package, John Lewis and Company, which is a department store in uh, the UK, um, just says number nine. 
so I'm not certain what these records are. I would, if I could find where it started, maybe I would know. Oh, I'm uncertain. So that's who it would be from, according to this destination set. Like, yeah, I, I would have to dig a little bit to find out about these records. I, I pulled this book mostly for those um, child labor records at the beginning, because I thought they were really interesting. Um, I'm not certain what these records are of. Not expecting that I would, just think, yeah, it would be a really interesting project for somebody, and I do think that we would have in this collection material that would enable exploration of that question. Um, skoom? Skooma? I've lost that page, Geek Outs. Sorry. Um, let me see if I can find it again. It's around here somewhere. I think it's S room, as in stock room, but um, that is entirely a guess, uh, just based on the fact that it's a capital S, a capital R, and then O-O-M. Uh, so I'm guessing it's an abbreviated uh, word for stock room. And that column uh, where that is located, if you go back to this page where it has, um, they, they had from, description, sent to, and so this would be from Rockwood Manufacturing. Uh, there's no description, but then sent to Stockroom would make sense. Uh, so just from context, that would be my guess as to what it's saying there. But yeah, I thought that I thought this was kind of interesting because it had all of those names at the beginning here of all of these teenage workers in this textile manufacturing plant. Um, and looking at them, they're most, most of them are from Virginia, some of them are from West Virginia, some of them are from North Carolina. Um, but the, they had at least, in this book alone, they had 247 employment certificates for teenage workers. Um, let's see, what should we look at next? What's this one? What's this one? Mm. I th think, ah, so this one is labeled, uh, it, it has a tag in it. Oh, I will hydrate in one second, Portico, thank you. Uh, the tag in here says company store question mark 1906 to 1908. So let's take a look at this in just a second after I hydrate um, <clears throat> and we will see what it says. Water. You shall look at water next. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> All right. So we are missing the cover. You can actually see, so this, this might be actually something of interest to some of you. Um, if you've never looked at how books are constructed, this is the spine of a book. Let's see how I can get the best angle on here. So, you see each ridge here? Um, each of these ridges is uh, various leaves of paper. So you get, um, each page is actually four pages, because you've got front and back and then front and back. But um, they don't occur 
back to back usually. So w w what we've got here, each, each of these ridges is a number of sheets of paper that have been folded over and then they're slotted in here. So the front page of one of these ridge sections is also the very back page of that ridge section. So you've got, um, I don't have any paper I can fold. I've, I've got this. So if this was one of the sheets of paper uh, that was being put into a book, um, it has been folded like this. And what you're seeing along here, all of those ridges are the folded facing of it. Um, hopefully that makes sense. <laughs> it might be twill tape. That is indeed possible. Um, and so each of these ridges is a bunch of pages that have been folded together into a small section. Um, and then they're pierced through and you can see they're stitched together. Um, so each of these lines here, this is all the stitching. Um, because of the size and thickness of this book, it's also got some cloth tape here that's been stitched in. Um, and then on top of that is where the cover would go. So if you ever see like a leather bound book and it's got bumps on the spine, those bumps are gonna be this cloth support structure or those bumps are gonna be the actual stitching that's holding together the different sections of paper that make up the codex itself. Um, and so this, this piece, just because it's lacking its cover, you kind of get a, a chance where you can actually see the construction of how a printed book is put together. Now, when it comes to like a paperback book or a trade paperback or something like that, it's done similarly, except that rather than being stitched together like this, it's glued together. Um, and the, the thin cover is glued onto it. Um, this is more of a hardcover construction. Uh, hi, Orangitis. But I thought since this is open and exposed like this, it'd be a good chance for us to kind of look at what does a hardcover book look like under its cover? Um, because this is a perfect example. And, and then this would be, um, you would get the, the hard, thick cardboard uh, that would go and get, this would get attached to that for the front cover. Um, and then all of it would be kind of sheathed in some leather. Uh, so, but that's not why we were looking at this piece. This piece is company store, question mark. So we wanna take a look at it and see why they think this is the company store records and what we can learn from them about Freeze, Virginia or the Washington Mills textile plant. Um, so, I'm uncertain what the first line says. Phillips Osborne. We've got one and one sixth. I'm uncertain. I, this looks like possibly buying some beans here. We've got uh, one and three half dozen eggs and some butter for twenty-two fifty-seven. And again, these are the corporate records of a textile mill. Uh, and so the fact that they're itemizing that uh, this. I don't know, Philip, no, I don't know, this, this Osborne person here, $22.57 for some beans, eggs, and butter, it looks like, um, C.L. Perdue, I don't know what they were purchasing, but they spent $5 on it, a number of people bought that, but I can't figure out what it says. Looks like S-E-N. Uh, 
and that's either an S or a F, but neither one seems to make sense to me. Anyway, let's let's look at some of these and see what we can learn. We have uh, so again, this is uh, looking at this to myself. I definitely think this is the company store records because uh, we have here what I'm assuming is an employee number or uh, some such. This is 452 W H Bailey, possibly. Not certain about the last name there. But $1.44 for some cabbage, $1.48 for something, uh, 40 cents for four dozen pickles, and it looks like a total of $3.32. Um, and then uh, employee number 252, Dr. Dobrim, Possibly, I'm not certain about that. Uh, we've got a dollar twenty for cabbage, ninety cents for apples, and chipped beef. Uncertain why that's combined in the way that it is. Uh, Two dollars and ten cents. Um. But yeah, so this is literally like. This was Monday, January 31st, 1906, and this is the daily ledger of sales from the store for that day. And it's unlabeled, but this, the numbers that are here next to the names, this appears to be employee numbers with then the names or department numbers possibly because this is Washington Mills Schools um, that was buying something here. Uh, but yeah, so the company owned the entire town. They owned the store. They ran the store. Uh, and so we have records here, but day by day of what people bought at the store. Here again, we have number 252, Dr. Debrim. Um, I don't, I can't make out this word, but there's, they bought yeast for 10 cents. I don't know what kind of yeast that is, but, um, and then every day they, they close out the ledger, uh, with cash outstanding and, and sales figures for the day. Um, which is just fascinating to, to think basically if you wanted anything in this town, you paid your employer for it, which is the definition of a company town. Um, sold my soul to the company store. Yeah, key squared. And, and that is exactly, this is the kind of store that that was about. Now, I don't know, and I don't think I pulled uh, wage records. There are indeed wage records in here. Um, so a researcher could potentially look through and compare how much were these people making versus how much they were spending at the company store and get a sense of whether they were doing well or going into debt. I don't know those specifics for this company town, but we know from history that oftentimes uh, working and living in a company town was not a way to have a stable financial life. Um, basically you got locked in and could never leave because you always ended up owing more to the company than you got from the company and therefore just had to stay because you had no way out. Um, I, I do know that working at this mill was desirable and people wanted the employment and people tried to get employment here. Uh, I actually have some letters of application for us to look at. Um, this lo just looks like cash. I wonder if this was people going there with a check to get cash like you would at the bank. Um, 
because it definitely looks like these people are getting cash. Just looking for some interesting ones here. See if we can find something especially unique. Oil and sugar, ham, pickles, some oranges, butter and coffee. Paying off what they owe to the store. Yeah. Oh, hi, Bissalicorous. How are you doing today? We are looking at the materials today of a company store, not, sorry, <laughs> at the moment we're looking at the records of a company store. We're looking at the materials today of a um, textile plant in Southwest Virginia and the company town, uh, like because the textile plant owned the entire town. Um, and so we're just kind of looking at those materials because all of the corporate records for this company um, basically document the town itself. Um, let's see, I, this looks to be a daily ledger of people's outstanding balances, possibly. We've got employee number, name, and then a total. So maybe that's, that's possibly what they spent that day, or I'm not certain. And again, this was labeled as company store question mark, which means they weren't 100% sure that that's what it was, but from context, it does look like that's probably what it is. Um, so we, it would take some research and digging to kind of figure out for certain what information could be gleaned from these records, but I do think they're rather interesting. Um, Plus, we got to look at the, the construction of a codex, uh, which is the type of object that a hardcover book is. It's, it's a construction known as a codex, um, which, you know, that's just extra geekiness for you there from somebody who had to study the history of the book uh, as part of becoming a librarian. Um, Let's see, I've got another one here. Oof. <laughs> All right, so this one comes from box 59, which means nothing to you and honestly means nothing to me either. I don't know what's in box 59, but let's take a look and see what we find. Because we've got another ledger book did I do? One second. I need to make sure I put my slips back in that tell me what box I took things out of. Um, right, so this is from box 59 and it's got some records. Oh yes, oh, this was really interesting when I found it. Um, when I found it. I was directed to this by Bess, who is the archivist who actually processed the collection, um, as being something interesting. And oh my gosh, yes, it is interesting. So <clears throat> this is maintenance records for the town, <clears throat> which since the company owned the entire town, if you wanted something fixed in your house, you had to go to the company and ask them to do it. Uh, kind of like if you live in an apartment, um, or I guess the term in, uh, in Britain would be if you live in a flat. Um, 
where you've got a maintenance person that you contact because they own the property and it's up to them to do the repairs. Well, the company owned all of the property, so it was up to the company to do the repairs. Um, so here we have records for building number one. Uh, this is from 1957. So mid 20th century, just before like flower children and the 1960s, like, 1957 here, and we've got building number one. On February 13th, they needed repair toilet seats. It cost, looks like 29 cent cents for material, $1.94 for labor for a total of $2.23. Uh, and this was, uh, building number one was occupied by J.W. Jennings. Uh, then on February 27th, the commode was leaking. So part of the toilet was leaking. Uh, it cost $1.37 in labor in order to repair that. September 3rd, they rep repaired the floors with $0.45 cents in materials and $4.49 of labor. Um, looks like September 3rd, they also painted $17.25 in materials, $17.68 in labor, and they charged the occupant for the materials for the painting. 1958, um, they had to repair a light switch. They repaired the right side basement door, connect range to hot water tank, repair leaking spigot, and um, repair flue and door. Repairs on building number one. Um, fascinating to me. Building number Eagle Bottom? I'm not certain what Eagle Bottom is or was in the context of Freeze, Virginia. The date on this is 1937 to start. It goes up through 1957. Eagle Bottom. I, I, I think this warrants a Google search. There is a road in Freeze called Eagle Bottom Road. There is an Eagle Bottom Creek. I don't know. It's possible this was one of the factory buildings that was located on Eagle Bottom Road or somewhere on Eagle Bottom Creek. Uh, that would definitely be something that would need to be researched if I needed to know for sure. Um, but yeah, the building number is just Eagle Bottom. Uh, it looks like they did some painting and some floor work and some repairs and chimney work and other stuff like that. Um, then we have more on building number one again. Building number two. I'm just gonna, I know there's the school building in here somewhere too, but look, building 133, building 207, 236, uh, 305, 346. Like, this is how many buildings this company owned in order to house its workers. Uh, just amazing. Building 401, building 603, 614. This is, this is what I want to get at, is uh, after, so these are the houses. These are the individual like apartments or houses um, for the employees, like 346 units, 414 units, 614 units. But you get past those. And I mean, we can look at any of these and they all are similar. There's some floor work. Um, there's a spigot, toilet, pipe leaking, window glass, screens, standard maintenance type stuff, and only rarely do 
they charge the occupant for it. So they're documenting the cost of the repairs, but like here on building 627, they charged the occupant the material cost for screens. So I would assume um, it was not standard regular maintenance. There was probably damage to the screens that was caused by the tenant in some way. Um, and so they charged for the materials. Um, paint, they charged for the materials. And then again, screens, and they charge for the materials. So none of this looks suspicious. It's just the fact that it was their employer that they had to go to for all of this that makes it strange. Here again, we have Eagle Bottom House, which I don't know what Eagle Bottom House is. Um, has a very unique and interesting name. But then we get, uh, here we have the general manager. Um, they had it labeled as agent's house. Apparently it's building 388. It is the general manager. Um, and you've got the records for the general manager where you've got radiator, installing lights, roof repaired, pipe frozen, connect radiator, baseboard receptacle, uh, electric stove, toilet pipe cleaned, um, shellac, paint, shellac, lights, install shower, free drain, water heater, stuff like that. But then, so after you get the, the actual like housing stuff, cause yeah, we all know company town, they own the houses, whatever. Um, after that, we have in here, the manager's house, new garage and restaurant building. Records for the restaurant building in town. Repairman's toilet, replace door glass, service kitchen, repair commode, radiator, repair door lock, uh, repair cooler, unstop sink drain. So the maintenance on the restaurant in town was the company's because the company owned the restaurant. The bank building. Uh, and it appears that possibly at some point that became the beauty shop, the restaurant, and the dentist office. Uh, but regardless, the company owned the building and therefore did the maintenance on the building. So not just the houses, the restaurant, the bank building, the beauty shop, the dentist office, the company owns them all. Yep, so here we've got Dr. Cox's office, the beauty shop. And, and the company records for this textile plant has all of the information about the maintenance done on the local bank and the local beauty shop because they owned them. The hotel in town. These are the maintenance records for the local hotel because the company owned the hotel. I just find it um, really interesting and like, my brain had gone so far as to understand that, oh yeah, the employees of the company, they live there, their houses are owned by the company, etc. My brain had never taken that additional step of realizing, oh no, they own everything in town. Like absolutely everything. And so these maintenance records for all of the buildings in town, all of the amenities, all of the services, are in buildings owned by this company. That is what strikes me about this. That's why I'm kind of harping on it um, because it's just a 
hard for me to conceive of accepting that, but at the same time, they didn't have choice. They got a job there and, and this was how things were. The car company, New River Motor Company, maintenance on the car dealership, just everything. If I look here long enough, I'm sure we'll find the fire department and stuff like that. Um, like we've got the school building, barbershop, doctor's office, uh, company towns have a super interesting history. The people living in them were basically trapped because the company literally owned everything. Yeah, and I, I conceptually knew that as, as a concept, but it wasn't until I was looking at these records <clears throat> while pulling stuff for the stream today that I really understood the company owned everything. You read a really interesting article about it not long ago, but you can't remember where it was. Hey, no, that's fine. But so um, I'm going to just note for viewers, as I sometimes do when we encounter things, um, these are historical documents. The terminology we encounter may not be appropriate for everyday usage. So the school building here, this is going to be like the kindergarten through like sixth grade or something that it's, it's the elementary school <clears throat> primary school um, and then we've got the high school building and then the next page here after the high school is labeled uh, the colored school hence my disclaimer about we will encounter language that is not in current usage uh, but this would have been the school for people of color uh, which would have been segregated away from the others. Uh, as you can see, the dates on here, uh, this ledger page starts in 1943. Um, goes up, looks like to 1958, 1959, 1962. Um, but yeah, literally everything in this town Anything that you can think of, any, anything that would have been required for this town to operate, this maintenance ledger has it. We've got the maintenance ledger for the store. We've got the maintenance ledger for the YMCA building. If you were an organization that wanted to open up shop in this town, you did so in a building owned by the company. So, like, I'm not saying that the doctor or the beauty shop owner or the bank employees were employees of the textile plant, but the building that they operated out of was owned by the textile plant. Which is just not how things should be. That is the definition of monopoly. Uh, This is the parsonage and the church. Like the Methodist parsonage. The Baptist church. I just, I will never get over seeing this ledger and just finally understanding what it meant for everything in town to be owned by the company. And here we've got, this is miscellaneous. Swimming pool, bathhouse, uh, coal bunker, ballpark grandstand, bowling alley. Just literally everything in town. The jail. Roads and streets. And keep in mind, this is going up to the 1960s in just this ledger, noting, like, 
The company owned everything at least through the 1960s. We know that they were in operation until 1988. They still owned everything in the 1960s. Oh, it wasn't an article, it was a Twitter thread, and you found it. Yes, absolutely, post the link. Um, Eagle Bottom is a creek in Grayson County. So the Eagle Bottom building, Kira, I'm not certain what that is referring to, and that was what I was trying to find. Also, um, Kira, if you wouldn't mind uh, copying that link over from the um, Rogan27 channel to the chat on the um, VTUL Studios channel, that would be great. Um, Abyssalicorous, thank you for sharing the Twitter thread about company towns. I'm going to click on it. Um, oh, it's about uh, aspirations that Amazon has. Uh, just as a disclaimer, or just as a note, um, we are streaming on Twitch, and Twitch is a wholly owned subsidiary of Amazon. Uh, so... <laughs> That doesn't mean I won't uh, direct you to absolutely visit the Twitter. Um, you can't access the other channel. Um, okay, I will attempt to do one moment. Um. Hold, please. I'm going to attempt to make this work for me uh, because I should be able to get to the thing. Um, let's go here. Uh, let's go ahead and mute it so it doesn't interfere with what you're hearing. And let me just go ahead and drop that right there in the chat. That is the link to the Twitter thread about Company Towns. And uh, thank you very much, Abyssal Icarus, for sharing that with us today. Um, yes. Oh, no. Uh, you know, just because I'm streaming on a platform owned by Amazon does not mean that I can't share information where somebody expresses their opinion about why company towns are bad while talking about the fact that Amazon wants to create company towns. We're looking at historical materials about a company town that, for all we have seen and all that I know about them, was actually not a bad company town. It's just horrifying to me that they owned everything. But they, looking at these records, they weren't overcharging for things. They charged literally for materials and very rarely did they charge their employees or, or their residents um, even the cost of materials for the repairs that they were doing to the places that they lived. It's just the fact that they owned everything in town that is terrifying to me because that meant that they had the potential to abuse that power. From everything I know, they were a very desirable, desirable place to work and uh, the people in town don't seem to have had a terrible experience. Um, so they may have been one of the good ones. I don't know, I would have to do a lot more experience or a lot more research to know whether they were one of the good company towns or not. Um, but it's totally topical to share that, that thread, Abyssal Icarus. Company towns were the worst, yeah. It's entirely possible that there were good ones that worked how they should on paper, but if they wanted to abuse it, there was nothing anyone could do, indeed. So, from everything I've seen about this one, they didn't abuse their position and power. That said, I have not done the research to know if that's actually the case. Um, so I can't say for sure. Uh, all right, I have some individual folders here for us to look at, and then I've got a box full of photographs. But let us start, let's see. Even if everyone was happy, don't believe in absolutes, the idea behind one company owning everything is wrong and feels like too much power in too few hands. Yes, and uh, as we know from platitudes, Absolute power corrupts absolutely is, is a saying for a reason. 
Uh, basically, if you give too much power to one person, they're most likely going to abuse it. And uh, company towns are kind of that same concept of, if they can, companies are beholden to their stockholders, at least today, uh, where they exist to make money, not to take care of you as you are their employee and live in places owned by them. So they're going to provide amenities to you as required, but at the cheapest way possible uh, so that they can maximize profits because they exist to make money. They don't exist to put out a product. They don't exist to do it. They exist for one reason, and that is to make money. I'm going to step down off of my soapbox now and continue focusing on the documents themselves. <laughs> doesn't mean the manager or supervisors didn't take advantage. That is, that is absolutely true. Yeah, it doesn't look like they abused their power financially, but it doesn't mean that individual managers or supervisors didn't choose to abuse the power that they had. And like I said, there's like 130 boxes of records here um, spanning multiple decades. So if we really wanted to research the company history and the uh, ways in which the Washington Mills Textile Company uh, exerted its power over the town of Freeze, um, it would take some time to dig through and get a grasp of the narrative that is told by the documents themselves. And then we would have to acknowledge that we're interpreting it through a lens that was put on the materials by the company because these are the company records so they are not objective they are merely the interpretation and documentation from the company's perspective of what happened uh, and so we would have to then expand and explore i do know that um, once this collection was processed there was an exhibit put on for the town which was one of the conditions of the donation was that we needed to actually um, once the materials were processed, we needed to actually share them with the town. And part of doing that was to hold a multi-day event with an exhibit of the materials uh, for the town itself. Um, and at that event, we had a drop-in station where people could sit down and uh, record oral histories and tell their story of their experience with the textile mill or growing up in freeze or any of that. So I know those recordings exist. I'm uncertain as to the status of how, or whether they've been processed yet. Um, but yeah, that would be another perspective that would be important to consider if researching the execution of this company's power over the town. Um, so what we have here, this first folder that I have, um, is application letters from 1941 um, that I thought was really fascinating. The box, this comes from box six, that I was originally directed to looking for uh, stuff about Freeze High School. But I ran across this folder of application letters and I thought they were fascinating. <laughs> Uh, so I thought we would take a look at them. Uh, so here we have from December 15th, 1941, from H.G. Shoup, Kingsport, Tennessee, uh, addressed to Mr. Seavers, possibly? I'm, I'm uncertain. Dear Sir, I am located at Kingsport, Tennessee, I am fixing looms in the Borden's Mills. I desire to come back to freeze if you can see your way to give me a job. Yours truly, H.G. Shoup, P.S. I wish you a very Merry Christmas. And we have a response. Uh, basically a carbon copy of what was sent in response to Mr. Harvey Shoup, Mr. Harvey G. Shoup. So somebody has uh, looked him up. Apparently he used to be at Freeze and then went to the Borden's Mills in Kingsport, Tennessee. Somebody's looked him up and written Harvey across here. So December 19th, 1941, Mr. Harvey G. Shoup, 
Kingsport, Tennessee. Dear Harvey, we have your letter of December 15 making application for a job in the plant here. At this time, we don't have a job to offer you, but we'll keep you in mind, and if we find an opening, we will get in touch with you. Yours very truly, Washington Mills Company, Superintendent, uh, initials LM. If I did research in the 1940 records of this um, textile plant, we could probably figure out who LM is. I don't off the top of my head know who that individual is. <laughs> yeah, they're just tiny little notes, but um, I, th I, I think these are amazing. And... Um, like, th these are real, like, these were job applications for people back in the day. Um, I don't have the, it doesn't, let's see, this is, ah, this is the letter that goes with this one. So, Freeze, Virginia, Mr. D.J. Whitaker. Dear Sir, I have been looking around for a job. I worked up Oh, I looked up your mill and found you had a nice job. Uh, could you use an all-round cord room man? Uh, know all types of machines and colors. Mr. Whitaker, I would appreciate some, something, and I can, finish, or I can furnish good reference. And if you don't have anything at the present time, would like for you to file this for application. I don't know you over I don't know you over sure name sir I'm not certain I parsed that properly but um, that is why I oh I don't know your overseer's name sir is what that is trying to say. Uh, that is why I am writing you. Will you please pass it along to him? Yours very truly, K.J. Jacobs, located in East Rockingham, North Carolina. Card room. Thank you, Key Squared. Uh, where they carded the fibers. Yes, indeed. Um, and yes, that would be card room. I read cord room when I read through it, but it is definitely card room. Um, and so, yeah, that, I believe that would be where they were, um, so I think carding the fibers, that would be like combing them to get stuff out. Carding is a mechanical process that disentangles, cleans, and intermixes fibers to produce a continuous web or sliver suitable for subsequent processing. This is, this is achieved by passing the fibers between differentially moving surfaces covered with card clothing. It breaks up locks and unorganized clumps of fiber and then aligns the individual fibers to be parallel with each other. In preparing wool fiber for spinning, carding is the step that comes after teasing. The word is derived from the Latin carduus, card, carduus uh, meaning thistle or teasel as dried vegetable teasels were first used to comb the raw wool before technological advances led to the use of machines. Basically comb the wool, tedious and messy, but also very important to the process. So here we have the response from November 28th, 1941. Mr. K.J. Jacobs, East Rockingham, North Carolina. Dear sir, I have your request for a job in the card room here, but at the present time, we do not have an opening in which we could place you. Your letter is being placed on file, and should we later find that we can use you, you will be notified. Yours very truly, Washington Mills Company, Assistant Superintendent. <clears throat> so this is a copy of the letter that went out, and I'm sure after this carbon was separated from it, somebody would have actually scrawled a signature. Um, let's see, what else have we got? What's the next one? Ah! It's very thin. All right, we've got a letter here from Luther Woodle. 
November 14, 1941, Woodlawn, Virginia, Mr. Dahl Whitaker, D-A-L-L, Mr. Dahl Whitaker. Yeah, don't call us, we'll call you. But, but it is, they are noting that they will put the letter on file as an application. And indeed, they did put it on file, which is the only reason we have it. Uh, I am writing you to find out if I can get a job. Uh, if I can get a job or not over there in the mill. If I can get a job, drop me a card and let me know so I will know whether to start a crop or not. I am fixing to crop with Martin E. Moore. I would like to have a job over there if there is any chance at there is any chance at I'm not certain this word uh, putting me one yours truly Luther Woodle Woodlawn Virginia I think the most fascinating thing about this is that the infrastructure was such that you had to cold write asking for jobs. Indeed. Sounds like it might be someone trying to work their way out of sharecropping given the era. Um, entirely possible. I, that would be... Yeah, I don't know. This, this is November of 1941. Um, so this is World War II era. Uh... This would have been a month before Pearl Harbor? Yeah, this is just about one month before the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor and drew America into World War II. World War II had been going on since 1937, but America had largely stayed out of it. Um, the textile plant would have been producing textiles for shipment overseas to support uh, allies in Europe. Um, so there definitely would have been a lot of production happening at the plant. You imagine that they suddenly had a whole lot more job jobs open about six weeks later, yeah. Weird how different, but how similar at the same time all of these are to current job seeking. Yeah, so these are just blind... Nope, that's not the word I want to use. These are just um, unsolicited notes. Like, this isn't... They're not advertising open positions. People are just saying, I really would like to work there. Can you let me know if there's any sort of position? Here's what my experience is. So it's, it's like the cover letter without the resume but it is just a short scrawled like I'm just taking a chance I, I, I've got a job but I want one with you instead um, which so, some of these letters were definitely like I already have a job but I want to come and work for you which tells you that this was a desirable place to work um, so November 15th Mr. Luther Woodle Woodlawn Virginia Dear Luther I have your letter of November 14th, but at the present time, we do not have a place for you in the mill here. Yours very truly, Washington Mills Company, DJ Whitaker, Su Assistant Superintendent. All right, we've got... Hmm... I'm trying to find the end of this letter. Aha! Alright. 
This is the next one. October 30th, 1941. Mr. John Sufis? Sufis? S-U-F-I-S, possibly? I'm not certain. Dear sir, do you have any idea when you could give me a job in the mill as I need to work? Uh... As I need to work. I'm very much they hate no woman that has little children but wants me, but what needs to work, especially them that hain't got no husband to work for his and and little children, if you could give me a job, I sure would appreciate it very much. I am the one that was at the office last Thursday with the little boy and would work on any kind of work or any shift. I wouldn't be choosy of any shift so if you can possibly give me a job, I sure will appreciate your help. As I need to work for the benefit of my little children, I am uh, I am over here at Joe Bowers. You can send word by Mrs. Bowers or Bill Gilly wife when you can give me work to do. I can't make enough at private work to pay. Uh, some ought to care for my children and have anything to soothe me and the children as my mother ain't able to care for them and my sis was in a car wreck and can't do any work yet so will you please do all you can to give me work yours miss opal miller care of Joe Bowers, Ivanhoe, Virginia. Whew. Sorry. The handwriting plus the um, rural spellings of things there made that one a little bit difficult to read, but I got through it. Uh, response. November 1st, 1941. Miss Opal Miller, care of Joe Bowers, Ivanhoe, Ivanhoe Virginia. Uh, Dear Miss Miller, at this time we have no openings in our mill, nor do we anticipate any in which we could use you. Uh, we hope you will be able to obtain work elsewhere in the very near future. Yours very truly, Washington Mills Company Superintendent. So a very impassioned plea from this uh, mother with some young children. Um, her mom isn't able to care for the children. Her sister isn't able to get work because she was in a car accident. Uh, she just wants to work so that she can support her kids. Um, and I mean, these are very form letter responses of, I'm sorry, we have no work at this time, um, which considering that that is the response basically going to everyone is probably accurate. Um, but boy, reading that letter, <laughs> it's just like, I feel really sorry for you. I hope you manage to get work. Hate, yes. Um, so orangitis, um, that is literally how it is written here. Your mother used that all the time. Um, so that is that is literally how the word is written here. Uh, it is spelled in the letter. Um, uh, let's see if I can find where it is. Um, so the the word as written on the page is H A N T. Um, and it's probably be written that way because that's, she's just writing the way that she talks and she, 
probably said haint. Not ain't, but haint with the H at the beginning. And so when she was writing, she's just writing the word that she says, which is H-A-N-T. Hant or haint. Uh, and honestly, that's no more correct than proper English spellings because proper English spellings were developed by writing down words that people actually said and then they became formalized over time. So there, yeah, this is just a very, it, it, this, is, this is real. This is somebody who knows how to write and how to spell. She's just writing words that she uses that aren't standard words that you're gonna find in a dictionary. And people do that too. Oh, hi, Scraff. I'm sorry. I don't know how long you've been there, but um, but thank you for showing up. Um, we're looking at uh, materials from the uh, Washington Mills textile plant in Freeze, Virginia. Um, and right now we're looking at some job application letters uh, that people had sent them. So we've got, this person is located in Pulaski. Uh, which I know a large portion of the viewers here are familiar with Star Trek The Next Generation. Um, and so you may be familiar with the second season doctor in Star Trek The Next Generation who was Dr. Pulaski. That is how it is spelled, but in my experience in southern, southwest Virginia, the town name is pronounced Pulaski uh, rather than Pulaski. Um, so <laughs> the USA has so many unique accents and spellings or words. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the United States is very large, uh, and there are a lot of different regional accents that oftentimes are influenced by the ethnicity of the immigrants who populated that era area. So um, you'll find that a lot of Appalachian accents derive from Irish pronunciations because a lot of Irish immigrants uh, settled in the Appalachian region, and so a lot of um, sort of, uh, so basically the, the accent of the Appalachian region and the pronunciation of words in this area tends to derive from uh, Irish pronunciations of English words. Uh, whereas if you go to, um, say, Louisiana area, area um, the Creole and Cajun accents that you encounter down there um, are English with, uh, that the accent derives more from French pronunciations of English words. Um, and yeah, so it, it's very regionally uh, adjusted for where the immigrants that populated the area came from. Um, the, the sort of uh, northern Midwest O sound uh, that um, is so humorously parodied in the movie Fargo um, it comes from Scandinavian uh, pronunciation and um, the, there were a number of, the, the, I mean, the large portion of the immigrants in that region of the country come from Scandinavian countries. And so that is why you end up with those pronunciations. Um, so yeah, regularly confused by accents in Louisiana. <laughs> You're a California native, yeah. Ohio native, living in Southern Arizona for about five years, yeah. Well, and so I, um, it's it's interesting. I've I came from a military family and lived in a, a number of different places growing up, and. Um, I originally learned to talk in West Virginia and had a very heavy Appalachian mountain accent, so that Irish-derived accent. Um, and then we moved to Hawaii, and I quickly lost that mountain accent, but started to pick up bits of uh, what in Hawaii is called pidgin, which is sort of a mixture of English and Hawaiian languages, but is spoken at very, very fast speed in, com in comparison to um, the, way, the speed at which people talk elsewhere. And so then when we moved out of Hawaii, uh, I spoke really fast compared to everybody that was around me. Um, <clears throat> and it took time for me to sort of shed some of that 
pigeon influence from Hawaii. Um, and then later in life, I moved to Minnesota and did pick up a little bit of that Minnesota O that even today still sometimes will slip in. But even when I was living in Minnesota, when I would be on the phone with somebody from North Carolina, little bits of that like sort of Southern Appalachian uh, speech from when I was very little would creep into my voice as I would be hearing somebody with sort of a North Carolina accent on the phone and I would slip a little bit into that um, just from hearing it and talking it because we are chameleons with our speech and you will pick up or lose accents depending on where you're living and what you're constantly hearing from speech. It's fascinating and absolutely, um, I, just, I just love that that is, is where reading an application letter from this textile mill plant uh, records um, kind of has gotten us in a discussion of accents. I think it's interesting. Ohio is more Midwestern than Pennsylvania, yeah. All right, I'm gonna read this one. So uh, Pulaski, Virginia is the location where this one came from. We have a letter to Mr. J.D. Whitaker. Uh, Dear friend, I'm writing to you, in writing to you, I would like to know if I could come back to work. I would like to have a job with you. I can stay on here, but it don't suit me to be away from home. I am asking you to let me know if I can come back by return mail. Yours truly, R.J. Noblet. And I know the reason I know it's Noblet is because the reply letter has the name. Uh, so September 22nd, 1941, there is a response. So two days later. A doc, or Mr. A. L. Noblet, Pulaski, Virginia. Dear sir, we have your letter of September 20 asking for a job here, but at the present time, we have all the help we need and are unable to offer you work. Sorry you are dissatisfied with your present place and hope you will be able to make more satisfactory arrangements in the near future. Yours very truly, Washington Mills Company, Assistant Superintendent. Um, I find this one is somewhat interesting to me because... Uh, um, he's writing to the Washington Mills Textile Company in Freeze, Virginia, saying, I don't like being away from home, I want to come back. And he's presently living in Pulaski, Virginia, which honestly is like less than an hour's drive. Like, but this is 1941. Uh, like, I don't know the significance of cultural difference between Freeze and Pulaski at that time, um, but honestly, they're not terribly distant from, from one another. Um, we've got a slight bit of time left. I think I'll read one more and then we'll maybe look at some photos. <clears throat> September 10th, 1941. Uh, this is from sent from Durham, North Carolina. Overseer Weave Room. I am writing you for a job of weaving and am experienced weaver. You may have some help that know me can come at short notice. Hope to hear from your room or hope to hear from you soon. Uh, yours respectfully, Thomas W. Durham in Durham, North Carolina. <clears throat> what I find interesting about this one is it's a letter, like all of the others, but it is written as though it's a telegram. Uh, it's, it's short staccato sentences that I, and honestly, the length of it, I'm, I'm half surprised it's not a telegram because it reads like a telegram. <clears throat> it just doesn't have the stop. <laughs> the, the characteristic like uh, full stop added in. <clears throat> September 12th, 1941, response to that letter. Mr. Thomas W. Durham in Durham, Car North Carolina. Dear sir, we have your letter of September 10th requesting work here, but at this time we have nothing to offer you. 
We hope you will be able to obtain work elsewhere very soon. Yours very truly, Washington Mills Company, Superintendent. I just, I find these application letters to be absolutely fascinating. Um, it tells you the kinds of peoples, the kinds of people who were interested in working there. Um, oh, actually, we should, I, I should look at one more. <laughs> I'm going to say that again, aren't I? I'm just going to be like, but one more, but one more, because I think they're fascinating. I think they're absolutely fascinating. Um, <clears throat> this is from August 30th, 1941. And this person is writing from New Braunfels, Texas. Um, Mr. John Sewers, Freeze, Virginia. Dear sir, I want to make application with you for a job as overseer of spinning or shift foreman. I have been here two and a half years as shift foreman in the uh, spinning department. I have been with the following mills as overseer of spinning, uh, spooling, and warping uh, Stark Mills in uh, Hoagsville, Georgia, Cold something manufacturing company in uh, Coldwater, no, no, I, Coal, Coal something manufacturing company in Coal something Georgia, and the Rocky Mount Cotton Mills in Rocky Mount, North Carolina. I can furnish the best of references. I am 57 years old and married. If you could use a well-experienced millman, I would like very much to have a place with you. Yours very truly, J.J. Crowder. <clears throat> Not the kind of warping that gets you to Vulcan on time. Indeed, key squared. Um, so this is one that's slightly different than the others. The others are all relatively geographically local. Uh, Durham, North Carolina is not that far from Southwest Virginia. The, the applications from Tennessee, not that far from here. Uh, the one from Pulaski is like an hour's drive at most from Pulaski to Freeze uh, in, in a modern car. It would have probably been a little bit longer uh, back then. Um, but here is one that's coming from New Braunfels, Texas, um, which is certainly uh, much farther away. And this one isn't just asking for any job. They're asking for a supervisory position because they have held supervisory positions at other places, notably at two, um, well, at their current location in Texas, as well as two other plants in Georgia and one in North Carolina. Um, they note that they are married, which honestly, I don't culturally understand why that's necessary to note in a 1941 letter of application. Um, I don't see the relevance of that, but I'm looking at it from a modern perspective. And in 1941, maybe that was some sort of signal that you were uh, stable and responsible. I'm not certain. Um, August 1941, I don't know exactly when the lavender scare was. Uh, it's possible that that was in order to signal that they were not a homosexual. Um, I'm actually just going to look up the dates of the lavender scare. Uh, if I can. Yeah, no, this this would have been well before the Lavender Scare got started. Um, if you're unfamiliar with the Lavender Scare, <clears throat> you may have heard of the Red Scare. Uh, Lavender Scare was very similar, uh, basically a political um, ostracization of so the Red Scare was political ostracization and uh, basically witch hunting of socialists in America. The Lavender Scare was the same thing, political ostracization and witch hunting of homosexuals in America. Um, but that didn't actually really get started until the late 1940s, so this is a little early for that. So I don't really know why he's noting that he's married in his letter of application. Um, the 
Response here, September 2nd, 1941, Mr. J.J. Crowder, New Braunfels, Texas. Dear sir, we have your application of August 30th, but at this time have nothing to offer you. Your letter is being filed, and should we later have an opening in which we might use you, we will communicate with you. Yours very truly, Washington Mills Company, Superintendent. Maybe just a way of saying I'm a stable, responsible person. Yeah, that's, that's my best guess. Not that this is a good reason, but it's, yeah. Like, th that is my best guess as well as to why they would bother to have a sentence in there saying, I'm married. Um, but uh, this, this folder of job applications, I just find absolutely fascinating. I think it is one of the best things in this collection. Um... But, I have high school records and stuff like that, but how about we look at a couple of photographs? <laughs> the high school records are just like, oh, we bought them a new uh, basketball hoop. And it was more of the, the company town owned everything, and in order for the school to get a basketball hoop, the company had to pay for it. Um, so what I have here are some photographs since we are basically at the end of stream and I thought it would be interesting um, to look at <clears throat> some photos from the town. Um, these seem like they are mostly going to be like 1970s time frame. I'm not 100% certain of dates and I don't have a lot of context. Most They don't have like information on the back of who they are. But um, we've got people just going about their daily lives. These are all people who lived in Freeze, Virginia, worked at the plant. Um, looks like they're having a parade here, a town festival, that kind of stuff. United Way which is a charity that still exists today. Definitely having a parade. You got marching band. And so, um, keep in mind once again, these are the corporate records of this place. This is somebody's daughter doing gymnastics at the local school. But it's part of the corporate records of the textile mill that they worked for. Because they owned the school and ran the gymnastics program. You only recently learned that uh, Casimir Pulaski, for whom Pulaski, Virginia, was named, was probably intersex, which is kind of cool. Wait, Key Squared, you know about Pulaski, Virginia? <laughs> I don't have any idea where you're physically located, so it, sorry, it's just shocking to me that you're aware of Pulaski, Virginia as a place. Uh, <laughs> beyond me mentioning it on stream here. But also that is really cool. Let's see, I'm just gonna flip through a few of these. Um, see what we can find. I mean, baby pictures. As part of the corporate records of a company that somebody worked for. It's disturbing. But these were all donated to us as corporate records of this company. But they, that is how involved this company was in the everyday life of the people. <clears throat> because they owned everything in town. Here we have some people who actually have names. 
So like for anybody that actually like grew up or lives in Freeze now or has um, family that worked at the mill, etc., cetera, um, and is like doing genealogical research, <clears throat> these records are actually very useful for people researching family history if they have a connection to Freeze, Virginia. You've actually been to conferences in Blacksburg a couple of times. And your partner's family is from Floyd. That is awesome, Key Squared. I did not know that. Um, entirely possible was not worth it. A company, like, the, the photograph could be, could have been used for a company newspaper. I don't know. Um, we just have an entire box full of, of photographs. Like, these make sense. This is, like, people gathering in a break room at the company. Um, it's just some of, some of the, like, children at high school doing gymnastics or baby pictures seem, seem out of place to me. Or disturbing to me, I'm not sure which. Definitely a very 70s vibe here with all the wood paneling. Um, yeah. Some of these, I know there are images here, I just don't know exactly where they are. Um, the one that I used for the, the tweet uh, was a picture of people in front of a no accidents in a year poster, which was pretty cool. Like their department had managed to go an entire year without any major accidents. Um, I just don't know exactly where that one is. Here you've got, um, here's an employee actually at one of the machines. Uh, looks like possibly her name is Maria Archer. Um, and this is, um, basically the spooling bobbins or spooling thread for use in construction of stuff. Also very 70s vibe to the look how integrated we are. We have one African-American person. Um, I mean, yes, but also if you look at stuff from the 70s and 80s, you actually see black people um, present and, and they're you see them and they are there. Uh, and then when you get into the 90s, they are there less. You don't see them as much. It's very interesting. I've noticed this particularly, I, I think I had that revelation when I was looking at um, music videos. I think was where I first noticed it. And then it, it holds true for a lot of things. Like you've got while I will not say that they were definitely treated the same and integration was, there are so many issues, but they're visible in photographs and videos and whatnot from the 70s and 80s. And then you get into the 90s and 2000s and they are less visible. <laughs> a year in a factory with no accidents is pretty great. It tells you they were concerned about safety and their employees. Yeah, yeah, Hannah. Some of the notes look like they would be relevant to lay out in a new... Yes, yes, must not worth it. And that um, potentially is what some of this was for. Um, I have this box. It's full of lots of photos like this. And then the rest of this box <laughs> is full of photos. Um, and company picnics, but some of it is just like sports competition at the high school. But yeah, that would be relevant for the cor corporate newspaper because the company owned the high school. It's a public high school subject to public education standards, but the company owned it. <laughs> so I'm going to put that away. We're going to we're going to switch back to my face for the goodbyes and while I figure out where we're going to raid. Um, weird that this one guy... Yes, yes, key squared. Um, it is definitely weird. Although uh, we know from the, the property records of the maintenance records for the buildings that um, they had enough people of color in town to run a segregated school for people of color. 
Uh, so, yeah, wasn't it worth it? Thank you for, for showing up. I enjoy doing this stream. Um, I'm going to look and see. I'm trying to remember what we're doing next. Uh, give me one second, and I will tell you what we're looking at next week. I'm also going to, while I do that, look and see who we're going to... Oh, dear, that is not useful. Um, <laughs> I don't want to log in. Um... Maybe I can grab it here? Uh, am I logged in here? Nope, I am on my phone. Give me one second, I just need to get to this spreadsheet so I know what we're looking at next week. Um, do, 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 do. I should have prepared. Uh, program schedule. Next week being... Oh, yes. Okay. February 2nd, we will be looking at the Carter Cash family collection. Um, so that is materials related to the musical families, the Carters and Johnny Cash. Um, we have a collection of material that uh, relates to them. And so that is what we're looking at next week, the Carter Cash family collection. Um, oh, did it was not worth it. I didn't notice that, that it also mentioned the church, uh, the, the, that the colored school page also mentioned the colored church. I did not notice that. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, so yes, the Carter Cash family collection next week. Um, let's see, should we go and say hello to the aquarium? What are they doing today? Kelp Forest Cam. And they are live, so I think that is where we will go. Um, we'll, uh, you came here, everybody who showed up on the raid came from Subnautica, uh, and you got to look at textile mill stuff and now we're going to go and look underwater at some kelp forest cam from the um, Monterey Bay Aquarium. Um, let me set that raid up. I do want to thank everybody for coming. Hopefully you will join me again next week 2.30 p.m. Eastern Time while we look at the materials in the uh, card or the the Carter Cash family collection. Um, and I don't know for sure what's in there. We'll, we'll find out. That's part of what this show is about. Uh, I just know that it relates to um, Johnny Cash and the Carter family. Uh, so yeah. Um, anyway, <laughs> thank you once again, everybody, for stopping by. I look forward to seeing you again in the future. I hope that you found this entertaining and educational and that you will come back in the future. Uh, thank you so, so much for stopping by. Um, with that, I will say goodbye and I will see you next time. <laughs>